Dara Lynn is a reporter who covers immigration policy for ProPublica. She's also a co-host of the podcast, The Weeds. Welcome to Pod Save America. Thanks. Good to be on. Good to be back. <laughs> yeah, th- thanks for joining us again. I wanted to have you on because there's a lot of conversation happening around immigration policy, um, changes in policy, new legislation, and some confusion about where things stand. So I want to start with a story and photo that went online uh, a couple of days ago that said, uh, the Biden administration opens their first migrant uh, facility for migrant children. People got very ups- worked up about this. Activists retweeted it. Reporters retweeted it. Um, CNN's Jim Acosta asked, uh, "Can we be a country who doesn't do this?" Uh, members of Congress did, and I think there. And I think a lot of the. Not sure everyone who retweeted about it clicked on the link of the story, but could you help explain what that is and you know what this facility is and what it says about the Biden immigration policy as it relates to migrant children? Sure. Um, so to be just kind of super 101 level about it, this yes, yes. is part of kind of this is part of the system that is set up for dealing with kids who are coming to the US uh, without their parents. There's uh, traditionally these they're called unaccompanied alien children, legally speaking. Uh, and so the government has a responsibility to, you know, keep them in to like take care of them while it finds someone in the U.S. to place them with, which is usually a relative. Uh, the Trump administration for a while was subjecting these kids to its kind of CDC order to just expel everybody who came to the U.S. without papers. Um, the a, a federal court in November said that it couldn't just summarily expel unaccompanied kids, that that was a violation of the law on dealing with unaccompanied children. Uh, and the Biden administration, even though that court order got revoked and it, it would have been allowed to do that, decided not to, and in fact decided to change the text of the CDC order so that it explicitly exempted unaccompanied kids. And so what, but at the same time, like obviously COVID is still a problem. The Health and Human Services shelters that are that are there to like keep kids in custody and take care of them while they look for sponsors have had to reduce their capacity tremendously in order to comply with social distancing and so we're quickly kind of as as they're taking these kids in again the number of kids arriving has risen some and you know the ceiling for how many people they can keep in custody is much lower and there have been delays in finding and placing them with sponsors because of covid so they're beginning to that all of that means that they did have to increase kind of the physical capacity and that's why that carrizo springs shelter which was closed in 2019, uh, you know, under a, a certain amount of protest or after a certain amount of protest because of the conditions in which it was holding children. That's why it's now being reopened. So there are kind of two different levels of questions here, right? One is the policy question of what is done with kids who come to the U.S. without parents and how does the, you know, what is the government obligated to do with them? And then there's the conditions question of, is this particular facility the right place? There have been questions, uh, certainly under the Trump administration, about the kind of particular nonprofits that these were getting contracted out to, about whether they were really more like shelters or really more like, you know, prisons or detention centers. Um, but that is that kind of specific question is separate from the bigger what, you know, uh, are we a country that does this quote unquote no. question? And so there's two elements of this. One element of confusion, I think, among some of the people who might have seen this online was confusing policies to deal with children who come unaccompanied without parents and the child separation policies of the Trump administration. Those, these are two different things, correct? Right. And this is kind of, to be fully honest with you, this is why I and a lot of other reporters spent a lot of 2019 and 2020 very uneasy with the way that kids in cages was getting used as shorthand for Mm -hmm. Donald Trump's entire immigration policy, because like Mm -hmm. it was conflating several different eras of policy, family separation in like the kind of everybody who comes to the border gets separated from their parents way was really, it was only practiced border wide for like a couple of months. And then the Trump administration walked it back when kids in cages kind of became a thing again in spring 2019, it was because there was, a lot of attention to there were tons of really just unprecedented numbers of families coming to the US. And so the conditions in which they were being held were just these really overcrowded facilities that weren't designed to hold people for a long time at all, much less hold children. And so that was a conditions question. It was not a policy question, but they got conflated under that kids in cages rubric. And so now there's kind of 
a lot of I think the work that you know things things that were kind of politically good for Democrats to encourage with that conflation. Now that a Democratic administration is in office, there's a little more desire from certain political figures to disambiguate them. But kind of that that work is that like that trope's already been laid down. Um, but yes, this is there are questions about kids who come with relatives who aren't their parents. Um, before 2020, the government's line was that it had to separate a grandparent from their who came with their grandkids. It had to separate an uncle who came with his niece. Um, in 2020, when they put in the CDC order, they said, for the purposes of expelling you, we will count you as a family if you're an uncle and a, and a niece or whatever, so so that they didn't have to take in anybody. Um, and it's genuinely unclear. Like the Biden administration has not explicitly said which of those two interpretations it's using. So like, in theory, some of these may be children who came with non-parental relatives and were separated. But every indication we have is that they are continuing to expel most families, and so they would probably be continuing to do that. What I don't want to suggest that the immigration activist community is monolithic, but what is it that the activists would like to see the Biden administration do with these unaccompanied minors who arrive? Is it simply a question of better conditions in the facilities or is there something else? There, I mean, there is something of a split between people who think that the HHS system is like, okay, but that there was a punitive turn under the Trump administration. And so the priority really ought to be on kind of ramping, you know, on on finding better, better facilities on kind of returning to a, a foster care, you know, not uh, like foster facility sort of, I mean, obviously foster care systems are themselves like not ideal, but yes. that it should be seen as that rather than as something punitive. Um, but there's also, I mean, there are also people who will point out that because a lot of these, a lot of kids who come to the U.S. without parents or without any relatives, it's because they have relatives in the U.S. And, you know, obviously in many cases, these are like teenagers, sometimes older teenagers. So there, there has been an ongoing question of if someone's relative showed up at the border to take them, wouldn't it be possible for the government to release them much more quickly rather than go through this whole like, oh, we have to find and vet a sponsor and place you with them and that that kind of thing. Um, that That's something that some immigration lawyers maintain the government could be doing that would really reduce the amount of time that kids have to spend in custody. Um, there's also kind of, I mean, in theory, you could also say that, like, if you were rewriting the law from scratch, that, like, maybe you say that 16 plus, you know, you can't be held with adults in an adult facility, but you can kind of get released on your own or cognizance or something like that. There's, you know, the, if you were kind of rebuilding the system from scratch, there would be, like, more or less, you know, abolitionist ways to do it. Um, but, you know, the the concern is that there that at this point, the HHS facilities do appear to exist along a continuum and that the that one end of that continuum is a lot closer to detention than it is to, you know, kind of community supported care. Another element of Biden's campaign promises that has been brought into question is he had, he had <clears throat> pledged to pause deportations for 100 days. He has been unable to do that. Um, for a number for a number of reasons, um, could you talk about what that is and perhaps how the Trump administration sort of hamstrung him in that effort? Um, right. So on its way out the door, like literally, this was discovered in the last month of the Trump administration. Like I think in the, in the last couple of weeks, um, Trump's DHS signed agreements with a few states and a couple of localities that basically said we agree not to change enforcement policy. And if we try to change enforcement policy, you have a right of action to challenge that. Which, there were a lot of questions about the way these contracts were written. Uh, it kind of turns out that that's not even, that that Texas, you know, used the contract when the initial pause on deportations was announced to go into a federal court and say, look, we were promised we could do this. You know, this is a violation of, you know, like, like this is a violation of this agreement. Um, use the exact same argument on why they had standing to sue that they had used in the uh, 
cases over DACA, et cetera, which is that like just by have anything that makes it that encourages unauthorized migration hurts our education system. Um, Was that an hurts. animal or a ghost? Yes, that's that's my cat. That's my cat. Okay. Yes. Um, hey, baby. Uh, you want to come say hi? Uh, but so the federal judge ruled with Texas and, you know, issued a temporary restraining order against the deportation pause, which is now turned into a preliminary injunction, not even saying this, not even based primarily on the contract, based primarily on the Administrative Procedure Act, which is the exact same federal law that the Trump administration kept getting hung up on in challenges to its immigration policies, because the argument made by the federal judge is that the Biden administration failed to consider less radical alternatives to this deportation pause and like didn't didn't kind of show its work in going through a deliberative process. Now, it's really, really not clear where the line is, because at a certain level, all in all immigration enforcement policies are matters of prosecutorial discretion, right? Like they all pr- operate from the premise of we are not funded or frankly given a political mandate to seek out and deport every unauthorized immigrant in the US and therefore we are making individual decisions about who should be you know about who we should go after um it's really not clear how you how like how much the APA can regulate that right because you can't say that like federal law absolutely requires you to do x y you know to to go after X, Y, and Z cases. So there are lots of questions. And like, in the meantime, this litigation has also involved a lot of kind of demands for information and statistics from DHS that they've, some of which they've actually managed to provide, um, but that is like more transparency, transparency being demanded on very short notice by the federal judiciary than like we've routinely seen from ICE in its entire history. So it's not super clear how much this is going to just kind of continue to be a thing for the Biden administration. Uh, but so far, it really does look like there's going to be as much, you know, it, it does look like, you know, because if you find the right court venue, it's very easy to find an idiot ideological an ideologically agreeable judge uh that there's going to be as much trouble from like the fifth circuit under the biden administration as there was from the ninth circuit under the trump administration you you talked earlier about if we were starting from scratch if we were rewriting the laws a few days ago democrats unveiled a piece of immigration reform legislation what are sort of the core elements of that and what does it say about how immigration how democratic views of immigration policy have shifted since um the 2013 immigration bill that passed the senate so the the u.s citizenship act which is what the biden administration kind of uh talked up in its first days in office as its day one immigration bill has now officially been introduced um it's what would have been called a comprehensive immigration reform bill before this year and like There are, you know, to the extent that comprehensive immigration reform has been used for the last like 15 years to mean legalization for unauthorized immigrants currently in the country, plus like a broader readdressing of future immigration. Um, What it doesn't have that previous comprehensive bills did have was a ramping up of enforcement. The old theory of the case was, you know, we're going to do this one-time legalization, and then we'll set up the system so that we don't have 11 million unauthorized people again by increasing enforcement, you know, by both at the border and like changing some stuff in the interior, et cetera. That isn't in this. And that's because Democrats are, you know, like it's, it's serving as something of a marker bill. Like, obviously there's not a whole lot of, it's, there isn't, a consensus that this could be done through reconciliation by any means. And so you have the question of how do you get 10 Republican votes in the Senate? So Democrats aren't, you know, it's it's not that they, there is, there is not exactly an expectation that this is the bill that President Biden would sign in a couple of weeks, but it is an illustration that Democrats are no longer kind of negotiating with themselves on this, right? That like they now see enforcement as something that has to be demanded by Republicans, not as something that is like good on the policy merits. Um, And between that and the fact that the actual path to citizenship, the legalization program is brought, if 
relatively broader um, in terms of who would be eligible and that it's a shorter period of time until people would be able to become permanent residents than we've seen in prior bills. Uh, both of those make it a relatively generous, relatively dovish bill in terms of what we have actually seen, you know, get the backing of Democratic leadership in Congress. One of the, you know, it, there's very much the lesson of the Obama years in the 2013 bill is is that wherever Democrats start on enforcement, Republicans will up it. So you might, so I agree with this, the you know the legislative strategy here. One of the even beyond the legislation, the, one of the challenges with setting enforcement priorities is dealing with ICE, the ICE union. Um, you know, this is a you know Obama had a this is what ultimately led, as you know better than almost anyone, what led to Obama's order in DACA was he kept uh, through Janet Secretary Janet Napolitano saying, "Do not prioritize." Dreamers and dreamers kept getting caught up in the system. Have I imagine this is going to be a huge problem for the Biden administration in terms of figuring out how they're going to deal with enforcement? If you have a, you know, I think is a lot of progressives see a rogue element. It's obviously where abolish ice came from. But have you, do you have have you heard about how the Biden administration or Secretary Mayorkas is thinking of dealing with that challenge of sort of reigning in the enforcement side? So we have gotten under the dude who's kind of running ICE on an interim basis, Tay Johnson, did send, send out a new enforcement priorities memo about a week ago, which is, uh, it, it goes, it's it's a more generous or like a more restrictive version of the memo that Obama issued or through DHS Secretary Jay Johnson in 2014, which was kind of the the only one of the Obama administration's many efforts to tell ICE agents who they should and shouldn't prioritize that actually like did result in change on the ground. And there were two different arguments. There was an argument that it got actually got change on the ground because Jay Johnson had done the kind of stakeholder work of getting ICE field offices on board and all of that. And there was another argument that it actually was just clear in laying down who should count as a priority based in very particular guidelines. And that made it a little easier to ensure accountability. The Biden administration appears to be working on the second of those theories insofar as like this is being issued by an interim chief. We haven't gotten a nominee for ICE director yet. Uh, we, you know, the in general, DHS is not really fully staffed with political appointees in any rapid way. Um, and so, you know, it's it's going to be interesting to see how that memo gets implemented. And that really is the question right now is, you know, in an environment where it's clear that a lot of rank and file ICE agents don't like those priorities, like, you know, you have people giving blind quotes saying, oh, they're abolishing ICE through memo. Stephen Miller is, you know, making the rounds in media, essentially encouraging, you know, uh, ICE agents who disagree with these priorities to kind of continue to do what they want. Um, but, you know, it really, we are going to have to see. And, and this is the kind of thing that frankly takes a lot of time because you're looking for differences in trends um, from, you know, like there isn't like a public blotter of ICE arrests. You know, it, you, you end up relying on the data points of like quarterly arrest data, uh, which is not, you know, like that, that's every three months and often doesn't come out until like a month after the quarter has ended. And on particularly on whatever cases happen to blow up, which can certainly give you an indication of, oh, this person shouldn't be like, shouldn't fit under the guidelines, but is being deported anyway, but doesn't give you a clear idea of whether the problem is this particular regional field office, whether that was a rogue operation and ultimately that person will be disciplined. So it's it's going to really take a while. And uh, you know, I like in my experience under the Trump administration, you could figure out the pattern on enforcement after like four months. Um, and then stuff started changing and with the and like when there isn't enough when there isn't kind of sustained local coverage or when there's other stuff in the news. And so these things are less likely to like go viral on social media. It can be that much harder because you just don't have the eyes everywhere. Last question for you, just as you point out, uh, progressives or activists sometimes blur the lines on the kids in cages policy dispute. One area where the Trump and the right blurred the lines was, um, was between, 
undocumented immigrants who cross the border and asylum seekers. And the, there's some confusion about how the Biden administration has changed the asylum policy. Um, what is going on with that? Um, that is an ongoing process because for the kind of for the same reasons when we were talking about just unaccompanied kids, like there is a the the current border the current regime for people trying to seek asylum in the U.S. is that they aren't they're still getting expelled for the most part under the CDC order. Um, that is something that the Biden administration has said it will review, but there isn't as yet any promise that they're going to change it, much less any kind of timeline. Uh, the people who th there's there are also meanwhile people who have been waiting in Mexico under the Trump administration's quote unquote migrant protection protocols or the remain in Mexico policy, um, who have court dates in the U.S. that keep getting pushed back because they keep getting not allowed to show up, you know, to cross the border into the U.S. for COVID reasons. So many of those people have now been waiting for, you know, everyone under that has been waiting for at least a year, potentially two years, uh, or the overwhelming majority of people. Uh, and so the Biden administration stopped putting new, stopped putting people into MPP, the, its first day in office, and is now slowly starting to let the people who were waiting in Mexico into the U.S. so that they don't have to be in makeshift, you know, refugee camps in all but name uh, in places that like, as we've known for as we've seen from Texas, like that same weather pattern was happening on the other side of the border, too. So people were, you know, intense during this intensely cold snap in Matamoros. Uh, the process for how they're doing that has been a little bit shaky to get started because it's, it relies on people enrolling online. And that's difficult when not everyone is literate, when not everyone has yeah. reliable internet access. So like, it's not super, and frankly, no one knows where a lot of these people are. Uh, the Mexican government, you know, there wasn't like any real effort to track them. The US government as often as not instead of writing a real address for where they were staying in Mexico, just wrote domicilio conocido or known address. Um, and, you know, it's totally plausible at this point that some of them have gone back to their home countries, that some of them have, you know, settled elsewhere in Mexico. Who knows how many people have, you know, been killed or disappeared. So it's, we, there isn't a lot of knowledge about how many people will ultimately be able to take advantage of this. And, you know, it's not clear how much effort the U.S. government is going to go to or like UNHCR, which is doing a lot of the implementation of this on the Mexican side to really seek those people out. But what you have right now is a situation where like there was, uh, I think, the the Times recently in, in its some of its recent border coverage identified a couple who the uh, one pair, the father had been. In, had been enrolled in the Remain in Mexico program and so was a, is going to be able to go into the United States. But his partner, who had arrived in November of last year, was turned away under the CDC order and is still getting turned away. She's not eligible to come in because, you know, people who were subject to that, there isn't a process for them yet. And that's going to be, you know, when that happens is going to depend on how much the Biden administration can, you know, can ramp up capacity to safely process people in without you know, risking epidemiological dangers without risking like people just kind of getting lost in the system or like dumped on, you know, it, for, for a while under the Trump administration, like busloads of people were just getting dumped at bus depots in El Paso. And like, that's not helpful for that community. That's not helpful for the migrants. So, you know, it's just going, it's the kind of infrastructure work that won't necessarily, that, you know, even kind of under the most motivated circumstances wouldn't be able to happen immediately. And we're with an understaffed DHS. It's not super clear how quickly that yeah. can happen at all. Yeah. I mean, that is the, I mean, this, I think immigration is probably the issue where this may be the most complicated given how aggressive the Trump administration was, but the Biden has it president Biden has an under an understaffed government operating in a pandemic, um, on things that are really hard. So this is this is very complicated. Thank you so much for joining us and help uh, helping shed light on this. And we will love to have you back soon because I think this is going to be an issue that is going to remain at the forefront for uh, for a long, long time. Thanks. Yeah. Anytime. Anytime. <laughs>